Hey readers, I'm back here for another chapter or two of Planet Omar, uh, Accidental Trouble Magnet by Zaina Mia. Uh, I've got my book, I've got my reader's notebook, I've got a pen, I've got sticky notes, I have all the things I need to get started with my reading today. So I'm going to go to the reading, the narrative reading progression to take a look at skills. Um, so let's do that now. Looked through and identified two things that I want to work on and they're here. Okay, so the first one is analyzing perspective. So I want to really dig deep into how I know that this, um, that how I know what perspective this book is written in. Um, so I'm going to notice uh, who is telling the story, okay? And then the next thing I'm going to do is, oops, uh, critical reading, growing ideas. So this is when I read fiction, I get ideas and information about the world. I might be learning about places, growing an idea about families, or thinking about my friendships. Now, the reason why I picked this one is because I had a lot of questions last time I was reading. And um, so I want to kind of just focus on this and think about how reading the story might impact my life. Okay, so I'm going to start growing my ideas. All right, so I've got my date, the title of the book, and my skills, Analyzing Perspective and Critical Reading, Growing Ideas. Chapter nine. Mom and dad were so happy that I was doing well at school that they said I could invite Charlie over. They obviously didn't know the bit about me not actually doing well at school 100% because Daniel made most days 40% bad. Well, depending on how much he felt like a big, huge grump that day, Sometimes he made them 60% bad. I wondered why he was worse on some days, and I imagined him walking to school and slipping on rotten apples. If you've ever seen a rotten apple, you'll know that they're really slimy and soft and can make you fall right down if you ever step on one, even more than a banana peel. So the more rotten apples he slipped on, the worse he felt and the more mean he was. That could be it. There had to be something. Charlie was mega excited about coming over. I asked him if he wanted to have pizza and he said yes, which is what I knew he would say because every kid loves pizza, unless they're allergic to cheese like my cousin Faiza, who does lots of farts and gets really bad tummy aches if she eats it. Gross. Charlie told me all about the flavors that he hates tasting in food, but luckily none of them are on pizzas. Peanut, coconut, banana, cinnamon, and coffee. Charlie was very polite to my mom and dad when he came over. He said extra pleases and thank yous, and he smiled an extra lot. I've been hearing so much about you, Charlie, said mom. Oh, thank you, said Charlie. It's so nice to have you over, and you can come anytime you want. They were being so cheesy. I imagined them as blocks of cheese, the holy kind that they draw in cartoons, but which I've never actually tasted. Mariam decided to hang out near us and show off like she always does. The weird thing about it was that Charlie actually liked her. She even came with us to play soccer in the backyard. She used to play soccer normally, but recently she started giggling a lot and celebrating with loud yays. It's super annoying. Charlie didn't seem to mind though. He laughed right along with her, the way he does with me, but not really with many other people in the class. All this laughing made Mrs. Rogers come into her backyard to investigate. She must have been on her phone because she was talking to that person, John, again. I can hear the Muslims. They're being noisy again, John. She said it very loudly. I mean, why can't they play quietly like good children? I can't take this much ridiculous noise. We all looked at each other, suddenly silent. We couldn't see her face over the fence, just the top of her white hair. And then we buzzed. We, burst out laughing and ran inside to eat our pizza. Okay, so that was chapter nine, that was a short one, but I was thinking a lot about analyzing perspective. So perspective means the, like who is telling the story. Sometimes it's a character in the story and sometimes it's a narrator. In this story, which one do you think it is? It's the character, right? Planet Omar, uh, the main character is Omar, and he is definitely telling this story. And some of the reasons why I know that is because he says, 
uh, it's word, he uses words like I, you know, it's not like Omar went into the backyard. It's I went into the backyard. That's one piece of evidence that we know he's telling the story. And the other thing is we get right inside his head, right? He is doing this thing where he imagines all these things. Like in this chapter, he imagines Daniel slipping on rotten apple rotten apples on the way to school and that puts him in the bad his bad mood so all these things tell us that it's omar who's telling the story this whole thing is written from omar's perspective Okay, so I've written analyzing character perspective. This book is written from Omar's perspective. I have no doubt about it. It says I instead of Omar. Also, there are so many details about what's going on inside of Omar's head, like Daniel slipping on rotten apples. Chapter 10. This, I'm really gonna dig into um, that critical reading skill of growing my ideas. I already had some ideas starting in the previous chapter about like Daniel and trying to think about why he's so mean, but I'm gonna see if this chapter gives me any more evidence. At school, it was getting harder to avoid Daniel Green. <laughs> One lunchtime, he came over and put a handful of sand all over my food. My stomach clenched and I got a lump in my throat. I didn't wanna cry in front of him, but I was really hungry. And that sandwich from last night's leftover chicken was really tasty, and my mouth had really been looking forward to it. I quickly imagined H2O swipping, sweeping, let me reread that. I quickly imagined H2O swooping down from the clouds to hover right behind Daniel. I made H2O pull a totally unimpressed face and blow steam all over Daniel's head. And Daniel had no clue. That made me laugh, and through my giggles, I said loudly, <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. Now I truly have a sandwich. There's H2O, his dragon, right? Remember that? A few people turned around and started laughing. Sarah and Ellie, the girls from our class, they were sitting at the lunch table next to ours, and they were giggling like crazy. Daniel stood, towering over me with his fists closed tight. His face was redder than his t-shirt and he was clenching his teeth together tightly. I pictured him as a Rottweiler dog, barring his sharp teeth ready for a fight. At this point, I realized that being smart with a bully wasn't very smart at all. Charlie must have realized this too because he had been sensible enough not to laugh and now he looked like a frightened little lamb. I quickly muttered the protection dua under my breath. Then. There was a loud growling sound and Daniel was launching his head toward my stomach. I don't know how, but I managed to throw myself on the floor out of his way. It was all very fast. Daniel's head went into my empty chair and his huge body following. He, the force sent the chair flying into the girls behind us, followed by a very big, very angry body that ended up on top of Sarah. I probably don't need to tell you that Daniel was in big fat trouble. <laughs> he spent one hour in Mrs. Barnes' class as a punishment. Oh, Mr. Barnes. Mr. Barnes has a mustache, a big one that looks like it could come alive on his face like a slithering slug. At the end of the day, Daniel was back. He still looked very angry. As we lined up to leave the classroom, he stood behind me and breathed down my neck. Don't think I don't know the worst thing about you. You're Muslim. I saw your mom the other day looking like a witch in black. You better go back to your country before we kick you all out. I didn't say a word. I just gulped. How could anyone think that my mom looked like a witch? If I'd have been braver, I'd have told Daniel that he was stupid not to be able to tell the difference. On the way home, I couldn't stop thinking about what Daniel had said before they kick us all out. What? I thought about talking to Miriam about him. Maybe she could help tell me what to do without having to tell her parents. I know they'd get all stressy and worried and make a big fuss at school, and that would definitely just make Daniel worse. Miriam might be annoying, but she used to stand up for me back when I was really little and we still went to the same school. 
But then I remembered the time just before we moved when I was quietly trying to get away with going over my screen time limit in my room and dad came stomping in like a giant who had just stepped on an enormous thumbtack. I could practically see the steam coming out of his ears. He had discovered the TV remote was missing its batteries. I froze. I didn't move. I didn't say a word. I imagined if I was a spider playing dead when someone is trying to smack it with a slipper. Then Miriam came in, came in with her huge pointy finger of accusation. He did it. It was true. I had desperately needed them for my controller. I got in so much trouble that day. I was banned from video games for a month. Miriam is a complete snitch these days. No, I could not trust her. Chapter 11, another quick one. Okay. Wow. So that gives me a lot of information to start thinking deeply about Daniel and maybe why he acts the way he does. First off, he seems like a really mean guy. He seems to me like he's judging Omar um, because of the religion he, he believes in, um, but he doesn't even know Omar, right? And it's making me think that, I don't know. I don't know why he thinks that. Maybe he believes in a different religion. Maybe he was taught different things. Maybe he just doesn't know anyone. He's never met anyone who's Muslim before. I don't know. I'm going to think some more about that and then write it in my journal. Okay, a long entry, I had a lot of thoughts here. So Daniel is a bully. I wonder why he's being so mean to Omar. Omar never did anything to deserve it. It seems like Daniel is judging Omar for being a Muslim. I wonder why he's doing that. It makes me feel bad for anyone who is judged about their religion, the country they come from, the color of their skin or their gender. I hope Daniel learns that it is not nice to judge. So the way I'm growing my ideas here is I'm thinking about kind of how this applies to my life and, you know, thinking about this story is fictional, of course, but in the real world, there are people who judge other people for believing in a certain religion or coming from a certain country. And that's really not okay. So it made me have a lot of feelings when I connected it to my own life. Chapter 11, three chapters, no way. We're going to do it. <laughs> I knew there was one person I can trust to talk about to talk to about Daniel, my cousin Reza. And luckily we were going up to Manchester to visit for a couple of days after the sand disaster. I was bursting to ask him whether he'd heard about Muslims getting kicked out of the country. Did Daniel just make up that part? Could it possibly be real? Reza is super cool. He's 12. He's the kind of kid that knows a lot about everything. If anything happens to his bike, he can fix it using his dad's tools, and I've seen him changing the oil on his mom's little red car, which he calls a clunker. And when we walk around in Manchester with his family, lots of people say hi. Reza must have really great pester powder skills. Or maybe he knows hypnosis, because he literally has everything he wants. That's one of the reasons why I love going there because we have two days of playing on his Xbox as much as we want, and we always have a midnight feast. Yum. I'm pretty sure almost every Muslim has a cousin in Manchester. I was wondering if they were all as interesting as mine while I finished, my, while I finished packing my backpack. Then my dad shouted up the stairs, get in the peanut, everyone. We're leaving in two minutes. You might be wondering why we would, how could we could all get into a peanut? We can't. This is what we call the peanut. It's a four by four, but look at the license plate. Can you see that? It's kind of blurry. This is peanut. <laughs> there are some things that always happen on our road trip to Manchester. Mom packs too much food for the journey. Dad complains when he's putting the luggage in the car. 
we always stop at the rest area and eat hot food. So mom's journey food is uneaten. And dad always says, I told you so. As we were loading the car with all of our stuff, Mrs. Rogers came out into our front yard to put a bag in the garbage can. But instead of going back inside, she just stood and stared and watched us with her suspicious eyes. I waved at her and gave my best smile just to see what would happen. She gave me her best blank expression. She must be the meanest person on the planet after Daniel Green. When we were on the highway, Issa started saying he needed to pee. But it's only been 40 minutes, said dad. Mom said, I knew I shouldn't have given you that apple juice. Dad said he had to hold it until we got to the rest area. But mom said he was only little and then he couldn't hold it that long. Miriam said, we should have put a, we should have put a diaper on him because he's a big fat baby. Dad said, stop being so rude. I hate it when we're stuck in the car and everyone is being all stressed out. I also hate the thought of Issa peeing on the seat right next to me. I mean, how yuck. I would end up sitting in a puddle of his pee. So I stared out of the window and imagined myself on rollerblades, riding alongside, alongside all the cars and going faster than them. So fast, there was a little jet of fire blazing out the back of them. Then I said, rollerblades, lift off. And they took me all the way to the moon. I don't actually have rollerblades. And I don't actually know how to roller skate. But that's the great thing about imagining. You can do anything you want, except pee. For that, we had to stop on the shoulder of the road so Issa could get it out. <laughs> I asked my parents why it was called the shoulder. Nobody knew. This is why my parents should have let me have my own smartphone, phone, because then I could have just looked it up myself. That night, while we all pretended to be asleep on our row of mattresses on Aunt Suma, Sumaya's, Auntie Sumaya's living room floor, Daniel and Reza told me that Daniel was right. We were all going to be kicked out of the country and we were probably going to have a World War III. I gulped. He told me that we would all have to go live in Pakistan. Have you ever been to Pakistan? I asked. Yeah, once, when I was five. What's it like? Will we like living there? I felt sick. I didn't want to live in a strange place that I had never been to. The five bars of chocolate that we had snuck into our beds and eaten attempted to make their way back up my throat. Well, the pizza is yuck, and you can hardly understand what people are saying, Reza said. Why? Because they speak in Urdu. You can't speak Urdu, can you? No. I lay awake for ages after Reza had fallen asleep. I imagined his quiet snoring sounds were from H2O instead, and that my pillow was resting on H2O's back. And it made me feel better to know that wherever we had to move to, I could take him with me. At breakfast, there was a big feast of food on the table, and I forgot all about Daniel and Pakistan. Uncle Fahad had even pulled out last night's leftover chicken wings. What's that? asked Isa. Me, said Dad. Where did it come from? A chicken. Did it lay it? <laughs> Everyone burst into laughter, and Uncle Fahad choked on his juice. Okay. That's the end of chapter 11. And whoa, 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 we have a new problem. So Reza, who's Omar's cousin, is telling him that, yeah, we're probably all going to be kicked out of the country and move back to Pakistan. And Omar has never been there, right? He's uh, So he's feeling pretty worried. I'm just going to make a quick note of that um, so that I can remember next time I read, I can remember kind of how Omar is feeling at this moment. All right, so I've just taken a quick note at the end of chapter 11. Omar is feeling worried. His cousin Reza said they'll be kicked out of the country and they'll have to move back to Pakistan. That seems so unfair. It is hard to believe. One thing I know about stories is that we see like little problem, little problem, little problem. It keeps it interesting. And then towards the middle of the book, 
which is where we are now, you can see, uh, we start to learn what the big, huge problem, all right, what it is. So it's a little bit Daniel, but it's a little bit like this looming worry of, is Omar going to get kicked out of the country? And why? And why is that going to happen? And is it allowed? And is it fair? Because it doesn't sound very fair. And it really has me thinking so many things. I wonder what you're thinking. If you want, feel free to leave a comment and kind of share your thinking. Otherwise, I'll see you back here next week for another few chapters of Planet Omar. Bye, everyone.